Brass, How to Set Up and Play. Brass is a game about the Industrial Revolution in England. I'm setting this up for a three-player game. If you were setting this up for a two-player game, you'd use the flip side of the board that has some of the locations removed. You would remove some of the cards, some of the distant market tiles, and players would start with 25 pounds instead of 30. Otherwise, gameplay is the same. The first thing on the board is to fill the coal and iron markets, put cubes in all of the spaces per the board. Next, you'll shuffle all the distant market tiles and set the cotton demand marker at the top. Next, you'll shuffle all the cards and you're gonna remove some cards based on the player count and the era. So brass is played in two eras, the canal era and the rail era. And so since I'm setting this up for a three player game, I'm gonna remove nine cards from this deck when setting up the canal era. And those just get set aside. Everything else gets, everything gets shuffled, remove your cards, and then you're gonna deal eight cards to each player. These are gonna be face down, hidden. Each player will get their own set of industry tiles stacked and arranged in order with the lowest tech level that has to be used first. So cotton mills arranged from tech levels one through four, coal, iron, shipyards, ports, and links. Canals are used in the first half of the game and rail links are used in the second half. In a three and four player game, all players will get 30 pounds to start the game. All players will have a marker set on the zero spot, that's the lower number of the income track, and they'll have a victory point shit on zero of the victory point track. So this doubles as a victory point and an income track. The top number are victory points, the bottom number is the income level. Finally, set a random player order for the first turn of the game, and you're ready to start. Each turn is divided into three phases. First, all players will collect income. Then in turn order, players will get a chance to play cards. And then finally, we'll reset the turn order based on the amount of money spent during the turn. So the first phase of the turn is the income phase. Players will either collect income or have to pay money to the bank based on their position on the income track. So to start the game, all players are on level zero of the income track so they won't be collecting anything. But as their marker moves forward in the game, at the start of the turn, they could let collect that level of income from the bank. Likewise, if they were below this zero level, they would have to pay this money to the bank. This is actually the only time in the game where the money being paid just goes straight to the supply. Normally, during the turn when you're paying for actions, money will get placed on the amount spent box because that will dictate the turn order for the next round. If a player is ever unable to service their debt, uh, they're gonna have to remove industry tiles from the board. They would receive half of the cost of the tile rounded down, and then they could use that money to pay their debt. The next phase of the turn is the play cards phase. In turn order, each player is gonna get the chance to play two cards, to take two actions, they would do one at a time. So for example, the yellow player would play one card, take one action, then they would play a second card to take the second action, and then it would move to the green player. The only exception is on the very first turn of the game, each player only gets to play one card and take one action each. Once both cards and both actions have taken, the player can then refill their hand back. So once the yellow player has played on a normal turn, uh, both of their cards, they could draw two new cards from the stack. You will reach a point, obviously, though, in both the canal phase and the rail phase where the deck is exhausted, so players couldn't draw any more cards, and then the era gets played out until all players have played all cards in their hand. After all players have had a chance to play cards and take actions, we're going to reset the turn order. The turn order is going to be reset based on the amount spent on the prior turn. So that's why all money spent on actions gets placed on the corresponding player color for that player. 
whoever spent the least amount of money is going to get to go first and whoever spent the most is going to go last. So based on the amount of money spent, rearrange the turn order. If there's a tie, you would just retain the turn order from the prior round. And once you've reset the new turn order, simply clear out the money spent and return it to the bank. So let's cover each of the card actions available to all players. One of the actions is passing. That's not optimal, but sometimes you won't have any other alternative. So you'll have to just simply discard a card and pass one of your actions. Another action is to take a loan. It doesn't matter which card you decide to play or discard to take the loan, but by taking the action, you can either get 10, 20, or 30 pounds from the bank. Based on how much you get, you're gonna go down the income track. So if you take $10, you'll go down one band on the income track. If you take 20, you'll go down two. And if you take 30, you'll go down three bands. And you can see on the income track as you go up, the size of the bands increase. At the beginning of the game, if yellow player took a loan and they took the full 30, they would go down three bands. You can see the bands are separated by colors. So here, a band is just one space. So if they took 30, they'd go down one, two, three bands, and that would be their new spot on the income track. Whereas if this was later in the game, and they'd have to go down three bands, they'd have to go down to the top of the band, one, two, three, and that would be the new location of their marker. There is a special rule that during the rail era, once there are no more cards left in the draw deck, players are no longer allowed to take loans as an action. The next action is the development action. This allows the player to discard one or two of their industry tiles. They always have to discard from the lowest level first, working their way up. And for each tile that they discard, it's gonna cost one iron. The card that they use to take the development action doesn't matter, so it can be any type of card and the tiles that they discard can come from different types of industry or the same one. They could decide I'm gonna develop both of my level zero shipyards with the development action. For each tile discarded, it's gonna cost one iron. So there's an important distinction in the game, iron versus coal. To use coal during the game, you have to be connected to coal. Iron's different. You do not need to be connected to iron. The iron can come from anywhere. If iron existed on the board, if someone had created an iron industry, you would simply take a cube from that. The cost would be free. There would be no cost for taking that iron. You could take from anywhere on the board. But if there was iron on the board, you have to take from that first. If there wasn't iron on the board to use for your development action, you could simply take from the iron market, paying the cost based on where the cube's located. So if you took that one, it would cost one pound. If all of these were depleted, you still have the ability to take iron, but it's gonna cost five pounds. So let's say the yellow player does want to take the development action. They discard one card. They want to discard two tiles. They're gonna discard their two shipyard level zero tiles because level zero industries cannot be placed on the board. So they have to get rid of these in order to ever be able to place a shipyard. So these will just simply be removed from the game. That's gonna cost an iron per tile discarded. There's no iron on the board that they could have taken for free. So they're gonna take from the market. They're gonna take these top two. Each one's gonna cost one pound. So the two pounds would be placed on their spot in the money spent. And that would be one of their actions. And the way we've just seen how iron works works for any time iron needs to be consumed throughout the game, not just for the development action. So any time iron's required has to come from the board first, and then it can come from the market, but you do not need any connection. The next action we'll talk about is the build industry action. So far, when we've played these actions, the card type that we've played or discarded really didn't matter. It especially matters when we take the build in industry action. There are two different types of cards. Normally they're held in the player's hand, so other players can't see them, but I've turned them face up here. There are what are called location cards. 
that correspond to locations on the board, and then there are industry cards that list the type of industry. The industry cards allow you to build the industry as long as it's connected to your existing network, whereas the location cards allow you to build any eligible industry in the location, whether you're connected to that location or not. So let's say a player really wanted to build a coal mine in Bury. You can see that this spot allows the building of a cotton industry or a coal industry. If they wanted to build a coal industry in Bury, they could not use an industry card unless they were connected to this city. So they'd have to use their Bury card to build that industry. The only exception to that is when you don't have any industry on the game board yet, the first time you put an industry on the board, not necessarily on your first turn, but the first time you place an industry on the board, that restriction doesn't exist. Could use a coal industry card to start my very first industry in Bury. Normally, you would have to, to play an industry card, at least already be connected to that city in some way. A player is considered to be connected to a city if they have some type of a link, either a canal link during the canal era or a rail link during the rail era to that city, or they already have an industry in that city. One rule is that during the canal era, each player is only allowed to have one industry in a city. So in the canal era, the yellow player could not have two industries in Bury. Once we get to the rail era, they're allowed to have multiple industries in a city. So the green player could have all three of these spaces with their industries if we were in the rail era. So as long as a player is connected to a city via their links or they already have an industry in the city, they're considered to be connected to that city. So let's complete this example for the green player. Let's say they want to build a coal industry in Bury. It's not their first industry placement on the board. They've already placed an industry. They would have to use a Bury card in order to place in that city since they are not connected. So let's say they play the Bury card. They would simply discard it. It just gets put into the discard pile. They're going to have to pay the cost of the industry. So they'd pay five pounds put it in their money spent box, and then simply put it there. And then this coal industry would now get cubes placed immediately on it that can be used by other players or this player in the game. It's important to notice that some industries are only allowed to be built during the canal phase. In fact, all level one industries, you'll see it as that canal link symbol, can only be built during the canal era. Once we move to the rail era, level one technologies can no longer be built on the board. They don't get removed from your player board. So if we were to be, if we were to move to the rail era and I want to build a coal mine, I'd have to develop, use the develop action to discard that tile to get to technologies that can be built in either era. You can see this doesn't have a restriction of canal or rail era. So if there's nothing there, it can be built in either of the two phases of the game. Whereas you can see, level two shipyards can only be built during the rail era. We're going to come back to the build industry action, but let's first talk about building a canal or a rail link. So to build a link, simply discard a card. The type of card discarded does not matter. If we're in the canal era, you would build a canal link. If we were in the rail era, you'd build a rail link. The cost to build one canal is three pounds. If we're in the rail era, the cost to build a rail link is five pounds, plus you'll see it requires a coal. Also, there's a special rule in the rail era, by taking the build link action, you can actually build up to two rail links. If you build two rail links, it's gonna cost you 15 and two coal. During the canal era, you're only allowed to build one canal link per action, and it's going to cost three pounds. Links always have to be connected to your network, but they can go through cities where you don't have an industry. So let's say the green player for one action, they build one canal link, they pay their three pounds, and then for their second action, they want to build another canal. 
So they could come and build one here, or they could even build one here, since this is connected to their network. Keep in mind, each player is limited to the available number of link tiles they have in their supply. Now is probably a good time to talk about how coal works. You'll see that different industries to be built require coal. Some require iron and coal. And as we've talked about, rails require coal. Iron foundries each require one coal to be built. To use coal, you have to be connected to a source of coal. Either on the board, you're connected to a coal mine that has available coal, or you're connected to the distant market and can use coal this way. To be connected to the distant market, you've got to be able to trace um, a network. It can be your network or other, other players' networks to a port, either a game port or to another player's port, whether the tile is flipped or not, that allows access to buy coal from this market. So now let's go through the remaining industries that can be built with the build industry action and we can see how coal and iron and the different industry tiles can get flipped. Coal is the easiest. It's going to cost pounds to build the coal mine and for level 3 and level 4 coal mines it's going to cost an iron. But remember iron can come from anywhere. It has to come from the board first or then it can come from the distant market as long as you pay the cost, but you don't need to be connected. Once the coal mine gets built, the number of cubes gets placed on the coal mine, which can be used by other players in the game. Once the coal is consumed, the tile will instantly flip. And this works for all flipped industries. Once an industry tile gets flipped, the owning player, in this example the yellow player, would get to move up seven spaces on the income track. That's the gold symbol or the coin symbol. So that each of these is a space that they'd move forward. And the flipped industry now provides victory points at the end of the canal era or the rail era if this tile is still on the board. So let's say this player wants to build this level two coal mine. They want to build it in Warrington and Runcorn. You see they don't have any connection to the city, so they couldn't use a coal industry card. They'd have to use a Warrington and Runcorn location card, but they'd build it right there. We saw that when this player built their coal mine, the coal got placed on top. Normally we'd place the coal on top here, but we can see this coal mine is now connected via this port, whether this was flipped or unflipped, to the distant market. And since the distant market has a demand for coal, this coal mine will instantly fill that demand. We would take these three cubes from this coal mine, it would get flipped because all three of those cubes are getting consumed by this demand. And this player now, the yellow player, would get two, three, four pounds instantly from the bank. They would also get to go up seven spaces on the income track immediately when this tile gets flipped. As a different example, let's say that there was only demand for two coal in the distant market and the player built this coal mine. So two of the three cubes would get placed there. They would get two pounds and the final cube would get placed there. So since they were connected to the distant market, they could fulfill whatever demand was required. Here there were only two empty spots, so two cubes went there. But since it didn't completely use up the coal mine, it doesn't get flipped yet until this final coal cube gets used. Next let's talk about iron foundries. Iron foundries always cost pounds to build and they always require one coal. And as you'll remember, you need to be connected to a source of coal in order to take advantage of it. So let's say this yellow player wanted to build an iron foundry. They had the Preston card, so they want to build it here. Unfortunately, there's no source of coal to build that iron foundry. If there was a port, if someone had built a port here in Preston, they could access the coal market because it's connected to a port. Or let's say instead they use a Bolton card 
and they want to build this iron foundry here, which is possible because you can see it's connected to a source of coal. It can be any player's coal and it can go again, go across any player's network and the player cannot refuse the use of their coal. So the yellow player would pay their pounds to the money spent section. They would consume one coal. If it's coming off the board, it's free. They don't have to pay anything for it. And then they're allowed to place that tile. Just like coal, iron can fulfill distant demand. And unlike coal, you do not need to be connected to a port. So this iron foundry is going to produce four iron cubes that would get placed on the tile. But we can see there's a demand for two iron cubes in the distant market. So we would instantly put two cubes there. That player would get two pounds from the bank and the remaining two cubes would simply get put on the tile. And when these get consumed, this tile would get flipped. Next, let's talk about shipyards. You'll remember that shipyards are the only industry with a level zero. So the level zero shipyards have to be developed away before you can even get to the level one shipyards that can only be built in the canal era. And then the level two shipyards, which can only be built in the rail era. Shipyards are going to cost pounds and one coal and one iron each. So the shipyard would have to at least have access to a source of coal connected and they could get the iron from anywhere. So let's say the yellow player, they've developed away their level zero shipyards. They have the Liverpool card since they're not connected to Liverpool. There's a port here, so this gives them access to the distant market for coal since there's nothing connected here on the board. And then with shipyards, they would pay their money. They would pay the one pound for the coal that they need. They need the iron, so they have to look on the board first. They can see they can pull this iron. Any coal or iron pulled from the board is free. And then shipyards, once they're built, instantly flip over. And that player would move up the income track and get these number of victory points when we do scoring at the end of the era. Next, let's look at the port industry. Ports are pretty flexible because you can see they do not take any coal or iron to be built. Level 1 ports, just like all other level 1 industries, can only be built during the canal era. Level 2 and up can be built in either the canal or the rail era. And as we've seen, ports allow connections to the distant markets. They're also used to sell cotton. So that's when a port tile gets flipped over when it's used to sell cotton by a player. And we'll take a look at that when we cover the sell cotton action. So basically players would just pay the money. Let's say this yellow player pays the six pounds so their money spent. You always have to build in tech order so they have to build this level one. Let's say they use the Preston card and they build it there. One special rule is that if you're building a port in Preston, you have to build here first before you're allowed to build that one just to block the cotton mill. And the same thing works for Lancaster. You'd have to build the port in that spot first and then another player can build either a port or a cotton mill there. Next, let's cover the cotton mill action for the cotton mill industry. So cotton mills obviously cost pounds to build and you can see a level one cotton mill doesn't require any resources. A level two requires coal. A level three requires a coal and an iron. And a level four requires a coal and an iron. So I've put a couple more tiles on the board. Let's say the purple player really wants to build a cotton mill in Manchester. So they are connected to Manchester via that link. So they can use either a Manchester card or they can use a cotton mill industry card. And let's say they've actually been developing through their tech, so they're already at level three technology for cotton mills. So they want to build it there. They discard a cotton mill industry card to build. They pay their pounds to the money spent section, and you can see they have to pay for an iron or a coal. Fortunately, there's coal and iron on the board, so they're not going to have to pay anything. And the coal is connected there and it's connected there. Coal always has to come off the board first, and it always has to come from the closest source. So let's say 
purple had some coal up here and they'd really love to use their own coal, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to if there was a closer source of coal. Now since both these coal are equidistant, they're both one space away, this player has the choice whether they want to consume that coal or that coal. Let's say they want to use the coal from the yellow player and they want to use the iron here. And so that would allow them to build this cotton mill. Cotton mills do not get flipped until we take the sell cotton action, but since the last coal and the last iron was consumed from those, these would immediately get flipped and the yellow player would now move up the income track. One important rule about building industry is you are, in some circumstances, allowed to overbuild other industry tiles on the board. You can always overbuild yourself as long as you've got the eligible card. So this player could use a coal card or an Oldham card to overbuild their own coal mine. They'd have to overbuild it with a higher technology level. So it'd have to be two or higher since this is a technology one to overbuild it. You can overbuild your own cotton mills, you can overbuild your own ports, you can overbuild your own iron foundries, you can always overbuild yourself as long as you're using a higher tech level. You can also overbuild other players coal or iron industries only if a couple conditions are met. First, there can't be any of that available resource on the board. Also, the distant market has to be completely empty. So in this case, there's coal on the board and there's coal on the market, so this coal mine is safe. It could not be overbuilt by other players. But let's look at this iron foundry. So this iron foundry, there's no iron on the board. There's no iron in this example in the distant market, so there's an iron shortage. So this industry is eligible to be overbuilt by another player. You'd have to still follow the rules that you'd have to use a higher tech level. So if another player, let's say it's the purple player, wants to overbuild this tech level, the iron shortage conditions are met. Let's say they have, they'd have to have a Bolton card since they're not connected. The purple player is not connected to Bolton. Let's say they play a Bolton card to overbuild this industry. So here's how this example would look. So they still have to pay just per the normal action. It still consumes coal. So they'd consume this player's coal. That tile would get flipped. That player would move up the income track. They overbuilt the yellow player's industry tile. So that just gets simply discarded from the game. This gets immediately flipped because all of that iron is going to be sent to the market. All four of the iron. So that would get sent to the market and they would get paid four, four, three, three. The next action we'll talk about is the sell cotton action. So you would discard a card. It doesn't matter what card you discard to take the sell cotton action. And you can actually sell as many of your cotton mills as possible, one at a time. Basically, you're going to, you're going to choose one of your own cotton mills, and then you're going to select either a port. It has to be unflipped. It can be any player's port or you can select to sell to the distant market as long as you're connected to the distant market. So let's say the purple player takes the sell cotton action. They've got two unflipped con mills on the board. So they're gonna look to see what their options are. They can see that they're connected via network here. It can go over any player's links. They're connected to this unflipped port. They're connected all the way to this player's unflipped port. They would love to sell to their own port here in Liverpool, but you can see it's not connected via canal link, so they could not get to this one to sell there. So their options are selling to this unflipped port, to this unflipped port, or since they're connected to a port, they can sell to the distant market. So here's the procedure. They first select one of their cotton mills. Let's say they select this one first and they say, I'm gonna sell since I'm connected to the distant market, I'm gonna sell to the distant market. So you'll remember these were shuffled during setup. You simply turn this over. You're gonna move the marker down the indicated spots. 
So this was three. And so since it didn't hit the bottom here where it says no more demand, this sale was successful. So this tile would get flipped. They'd move up the income track based on the number of spaces on the cotton mill. They would also move up the income track based on two here since that's where the market, where the marker ended up. Now using the same action, they can try to sell their second cotton mill. They would follow the same procedure. So they would say, I'm going to sell this cotton mill. And since this market isn't fully plummeted yet, I'm going to sell again to the distant market. So they can flip another tile. It's going to go down two spots this time. This tile would get flipped and they'd earn that many spaces on the income track along with an additional one space based on the con demand marker. Let's look at a different example. Let's flip these back over and say the purple player is taking this sell con action. And let's say the con demand has already been depleted a little bit from past sell cotton actions. So they decide the same thing. I'm going to sell this con mill and I'm going to sell it to the distant market, but it's minus four. So you can see going down four spaces is going to plummet. So there was no more demand. So this cotton mill actually did not sell. So it does not flip and that actually ends the action for this player. They don't even get a chance to sell that cotton mill to another available port. So when the demand is low, it's risky selling to the distant market. So instead of doing that, that player may decide, you know what, this marker's too low, I'm worried about it, I'm instead going to sell this con mill to this tile. So these would get flipped. Both players would earn their advancement on the income track. And for this one, now they can decide to sell to the distant market or they can sell to another player's port. They can see that it's connected all the way up to here to this yellow one, so they're gonna to sell to this player. The player cannot refuse, it has to get sold, and then this one would get flipped, and that completed their action. They used one sell con action to sell both of their con mills to player ports that they were connected to that were unflipped. One other option that players have available to them is what's called the double build or the super build they can use any two of their cards as any location card. Now this would count as both actions on their turn and you still have to follow the normal rules. Normally you would do this if you need to build in a location where you don't have the location card. So let's say for example, the green player really wants to build an iron foundry in Preston. They see that the market can take some of it so they could really earn some money they do not have a Preston card. So they're gonna decide, they're gonna take any two cards from their hand, it's gonna count as both of their actions, and they're gonna do a double build. So they'll discard both of those cards, doesn't matter what they are, and they're gonna convert those into the equivalent of a Preston card to allow them to build that iron foundry in Preston. Both the canal and the rail era will come to an end once all players have played all cards in their hand and then we do end of era scoring of victory points. At the end of both the canal and the rail era, players are gonna get victory points based on the number of links they have to flipped industry tiles, and then they're gonna score the victory points on their flipped industry tiles. Also, at the end of the canal era, all level one technology is gonna come off the board, whether it's flipped or not and level one technology includes canal links. So the easiest way to score the end of the canal era is to first count the links and simply remove them as they're counted. Remember, you only get points for being connected to flipped industry tiles. So this link is worth one, two points. Since both these tiles were flipped, we could see the gold coin there indicating they were flipped, and it's connected to this one, which is flipped, but this tile did not get flipped. So this one canal link is worth one, two, three points, and it can come off the board. This canal link is worth one, two, three points, so it can come off the board. Once the green player removes and counts their victory points for their links, then they can simply count their victory points on all of their flipped tiles. So they would look at the pink symbol 
on all of their flip tiles. Then you would simply go to the next player. You'll notice that some links can be connected to these off-board locations like Yorkshire, and there's two gold coins there. So this one link, while there's no flipped industry tiles here, it's connected to two flipped industries, or the equivalent of, in Yorkshire. So this one link would get removed, but it's worth two victory points. Also, being connected to these off-board locations is the equivalent of being connected to a player's port. So being connected to Yorkshire and either the canal or the rail era gives you access to the distant market for both buying coal and selling cotton. So you can see there's a couple of these off-board locations that have the port symbol. This next link we can see isn't connected to any flipped industry tiles here and only one flipped industry tile here since this cotton mill wasn't able to get flipped during the canal era. So this link gets removed and it's just worth one victory point. Also for the yellow player, this cotton mill isn't going to score any victory points since it wasn't flipped. Nor is this coal mine since it didn't get flipped. You're, the yellow player is only going to count victory points for their flip tiles. So continue for every player, removing their links, counting their victory points, and then counting their victory points on their flipped industry tiles. Each player's victory points from the canal era can simply be marked on the victory point track using the top number and the player's top hat or victory point marker. Once each player has scored and recorded all their victory points at the end of the canal era, all level one technology is going to come off the board regardless of whether it was flipped or not. This port wasn't flipped, but you can see it's a level two technology, so it can stay on the board. The shipyard, level one shipyard is gonna come off the board. This level one coal mine, even though the coal never got used, is gonna come off the board. So you're gonna remove all level one technology. This con mill is safe since it's a level two, even though it didn't get flipped, but this level one coal mine would get removed. Next, to set up for the rail era, you're going to shuffle back the distant market tiles, shuffle them and reset them. You're going to move the con demand marker all the way to the top. You would have reset turn order like normal at the end of a turn. Next, you're going to reshuffle all of the cards, including the ones that were removed based on the player count to start the canal era. After they're reshuffled, you're going to remove cards based on the rail era and the number of players. So based on three players in the rail era, we're gonna remove three cards, and then you're gonna deal eight cards to each player. It's also a good idea to mark when the last turn for taking a loan is. You'll remember that once the card deck is, is exhausted, players are no longer allowed to take loans. One thing you won't do at the start of the rail era is refill this market. Whatever the end state is at the end of the Canala era will be the start state. The rail era will come to an end just like the Canal era did when all cards from all players' hands have been played. You're going to score victory points in the same way. You'll score rail links that are connected to flipped industry tiles, and you'll score all of your flip tiles. The only addition at the end of the rail era, players will also get one victory point for each 10 pounds that are left in their personal supply. You'll add the victory points from the canal era to the victory points scored in the rail era. Most victory points wins. If there is a tie, whoever's higher on the income track would break the tie. And then the second tiebreaker would be most cash in hand. And if there's still a tie, it would be based on what the new turn order would have been at the end of the last turn. And that should be everything you need to set up and play brass.